My name is Emily Kreider. I'm your pastor of Family Ministry, and occasionally I do other stuff. So uh, I'm happy to be with you this morning to preach uh, and to teach this word on Palm Sunday. I know that we have been in this season called One Week, where we have been going through the last week of the life of Jesus. The gospel writers took nearly half of each of their gospel books to talk about simply the last week of Jesus' life. And so we've wanted to dive into that this Lenten season to really appreciate what is going on here. And we're only scratching the surface. There is so much happening on each one of these one week days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We could go on and on and on and on. They've given me Palm Sunday. But wait a minute. Wasn't that didn't we start on the Palm Sunday? Isn't that how it goes? So I'm going to give you whiplash this morning. We're going to go back to the beginning, to Palm Sunday, and then I'm going to mention just a couple things about what I would be preaching on this one week, Saturday. As you can imagine, there's not much written about Saturday. After Jesus passes, dies on the cross, what, now what? And so we'll talk a little bit about that, but I want us to rewind to Palm Sunday and all of the expectations that came with it. The people of Israel for ages had been waiting for their Messiah, their triumphant king, to come and reset the reign and rule of his kingdom on earth. They'd been waiting for their mighty king, their warrior, to come on a white horse and take over to make things right. But expectations are sometimes disappointed in our life, are they not? How many of you have had an expectation that hasn't been met? Yeah. And the results are sort of devastating, depending on your range. Now, I have a couple of funny examples I want to share with you. Have you ever rented a VRBO and you get there and it's a little different than expected? (laughs) You're looking for the palatial, and the GPS says it's right here. It says, are you sure this is the right address? The GPS says it's right here on this ramshackle place. What about the next one? You might be a cake baker, and you're going for the Easter bunny, (laughs) and this is what it ends up looking like. What about the next one? It's a little creepier, even. Hi, yikes. (laughs) Sometimes the reality can frighten us a little bit, can it? When we're expecting one thing, and then we end up with a different result. That's my um, cake decorating skills right there. It's not actually, but you know. All right, what about this last one? Nailed it. Just totally nailed it. Uh, if you're uncertain, that's, that's Ariel from The Little Mermaid. On the right, I'm, I'm uncertain. Uh, I'm just uncertain. There's, there are no words. So we're going to read a little bit now from John chapter 12 to get us acquainted with what was happening on Palm Sunday. If you want to pull out your um, Bibles that you may have brought with you or there's some pew Bibles in front of you, I'll kind of walk you through where to find it. The book of John is the fourth in the New Testament. So it's the last, in the last third of the Bible we get the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the fourth. There are four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're going to read from the book of John starting in chapter 12. Those bold numbers are the chapter number, and then you'll find the verse 12 shortly thereafter. I better make sure I've found it too. But let's go back and read about this triumphal entry. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look, how the whole world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. So here we are. Jesus has come. It's been this awaited moment for the triumphal entry, and he comes 
on a colt. This is anticipating Passover. Now, the population of Jerusalem and Passover goes from about 50,000 people to almost 150,000 people. So it nearly triples. Check my math. It's not good, so you'll have to just... It gets huge. Now, what is it with these palms that they wave them around? Let me give you a little bit of history. 150 years prior to the life of Jesus, Judas Maccabeus, yeah, I don't know how to spell it. Judas Maccabeus came in leading the Jews to throw over the Seleucian dynasty. It was a group of people that was ruling the nation that was outside of the Jewish folks. They were threatened by this dynasty, and, they, and Judas, Judas Maccabeus came, led the revolt, and they conquered, and then they were once again reigning and ruling over the nation of Israel. When Judas came back from this great triumph, they waved palms, and they imprinted the palm on the coin, their currency, because it meant so much to them of what they had accomplished. 150 years later, who's now in control again? Not the Jews. For so long, they have been expecting their triumphal king. So they're waving these palms. This is the moment that Jesus has come to be their king. They're waving them and saying, Hosanna, which really means be our great liberator. Save us now. We need you. They have all these expectations that go back all the way to Psalm 118 that I'll read for you. Let's put it up on the screen here. They're greeting Jesus as their nas national liberator because of this text. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, you heard this in our call to worship. With bows in hand, join in the feastal procession up to the horns of the altar. Jesus had, in the Old Testament, all of these prophets in Isaiah, Zechariah 6.6, 6, calling out that the king would come riding on a colt. We read this in the Gospel of John. They were hearkening back to the book of Zechariah, the prophet, who said, your king will come on a donkey. So they waved their palms and said, save us now. Fast forward, however, to Holy Saturday. So if in, we're, we're in this one-week series, they've done all this, thousands of people had come, they've heard about what he did with Lazarus, they're coming to see this triumphal king, fast forward to Saturday. The disciples are sitting there, Jesus had attempted to warn them, we're going to talk about that. What do they do? This king that they thought was going to come and reign and rule is dead? At the hand of the Romans? How did we get here? Have any of you wondered in your broken expectation, time out, how did we get here? You're met maybe with grief and uncertainty. I can't imagine what the disciples and, and the followers of Jesus, the women that came with them, Mary... Uh, and, and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, what did they all think? Were they replaying all of the events of the week, going, man, that triumphal entry, what? none of this makes any sense. He was coming to save us, to set up his kingdom in our midst. Now, I love the book of John. I love what he has done so poetically throughout this particular gospel. If you've never read straight through a gospel, um, you'll hear Anthony say this and others of us just because John's so great, but check out the book of John. Read it from front to back, maybe during this holy week. Make that a task to read through the book of John and find out what Jesus is doing here and what he might still be doing in our own lives. But you'll notice as you read that some themes in John are all about the word. It starts with the word became flesh and dwelled among us. You might hear themes about water. God, Jesus, is the living water. He meets the Samaritan woman in chapter 4 to say, the living water, I am the living water. You'll hear about light in chapter 6 and 7. You'll hear about um, time. John uses often 
this phrase, as he's, he's saying that Jesus uses this phrase, but John captures it a lot, saying, my time has not yet come. So Jesus will have turned water into wine as his first miracle. He'll have met with Nicodemus in chapter 3, met with the Samaritan woman. You'll have seen healings and whatever else. And at the end of all of these really miraculous moments, he says to the crowd, don't say too much. My time has not yet come. Or he'll say to the person that he's healed, keep this to yourself. My time has not yet come. He didn't want to reveal his messianic nature, his messianic promise, until the time was just right, because he knew he'd only have a certain window before the Pharisees would come and take a, and, and take a hold of him and the Romans would take his life. So the triumphal entry, here it comes. It's sort of his way of saying, my time has finally come. But what happens previously should have tipped off the disciples. Have you ever had an expectation? You get to the failed part of that expectation. You're saying, how did we get here? And in hindsight, you're like, oh, now I see how this series of events unfolded in the way that it did. But I couldn't see it in the moment. Well, the gospel writers are able to write with hindsight. Hindsight is twenty twenty. So as they're writing these things, we begin to see what's happening. In chapter 11, before the triumphal entry, we get the narrative of Lazarus. Lazarus being raised from the dead. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read through the whole thing. But a few things I want to print out, or point out, rather. Uh, Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. He was from Bethany. Uh, Mary and Martha were the sisters of Lazarus. You might remember that them from the um, famous women's ministry parable that we all get to hear, be a Mary, not a Martha. That was funny. If you've grown up in the church. Are you ever tired of hearing about be a Mary, not a Martha? Now listen, I'm type A enough. I'm a Martha a lot. But Jesus meets me in my Martha. It's fine. We're not preaching about them. Okay, so Jesus is friends with these folks. He's tight. He spent time in their home. He knows them. Lazarus is a friend of his. So when he hears that he's sick and the disciples say, we really ought to go, Jesus. We really ought to go do something about this. You're being called upon. Jesus said, okay, I've heard. And then he waits two more days. Now, your friend is on their deathbed. And they start to call the family around. Come quickly. Say your goodbyes. You, you don't wait two more days. You do everything you can to move heaven and earth to get to that friend so you could say your goodbyes. You could have your final moment of closure. Jesus waits two more days, meaning that it wasn't until the third day that he went and rose Lazarus from the dead. The third day he rose Lazarus from the dead. Sound familiar? He's showing his power, his might, his messianic purpose was not just to reign and rule, but to bring life. And he starts with Lazarus. Pay attention, he says, this is what I will do for you. When you're good and dead, three days stinky, I can raise you from the dead and I'm going to show you how because I'm going to do it for myself. You can't see that in the moment, can you? You're thinking, Jesus, what are you up to waiting around for this? He waits, and on the third day, Lazarus was raised. So when we get to um, just a f chapter 12, just a few verses later, we start with Jesus meeting once again at the Passover at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Now, Mary and Martha were there in their grief, and Jesus met them when Lazarus was in that tomb. And they saw what Jesus did, and for them, it clicked. They knew who this king was, this Messiah, and they wondered what might happen with his life. Mary understood the risk that Jesus had taken in raising Lazarus. And so when we get to her in chapter 12, verses 1 through whatever, do we have that on the screen? Let's read this one. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Rightfully so. Martha served as she would. 
while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Let's keep going. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, about a pound, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Keep going. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bags, he used to help himself to what was put into it, like my children with the offering plate. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. These women knew. They could see it. The disciples needed a bit of hindsight. These women, who were also disciples, knew what was happening. And what she did, Mark even says that, that she anointed his head. But in fact, there was so much perfume, a pound of perfume. If you're allergic to perfume in this room, you're like, what on earth? Could have actually covered his whole body, which would have completed and served the requirement for anointing at burial. She was preparing his body for death, preparing it for burial. The whole body covered. But it's this hindsight that gives us 2020. The Holy Spirit was giving inspiration along the way for these women who could prepare him for burial, for this triumphal entry that was taking place, because then he goes in to the city on the donkey, and he's ready. And he goes in humbly to the cross, and he holds this messianic expectation by turning over the tables and cursing the fig tree and all of the things that we've heard about these last few weeks in this sermon series. But what happens in our lives when expectations are disappointed and don't go quite right? It's one thing to show up to a VRBO and you end up in some like shack in the middle of nowhere. That's really frustrating and can ruin your vacation. But what happens when uh, you're disappointed by your family? Your parents, your siblings. I should be careful my parents are here, so I shouldn't say anything to Just kidding. What happens, though, when it, those expectations are a part of real life? When the rubber meets the road? How many of you, I wonder, have been disappointed in your expectations of God? Like those disciples sitting there on Holy Saturday in their grief going, I thought you were going to do this, and I'm not sure you kept your promise. Jesus, what is happening here? I've been in my own seasons of life being disappointed with God. Where he felt far away in college, there was a season that St. John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. Where I was wrestling with the goodness of God versus the expectations that I thought he had for me. And then, consequentially, the expectations I had for him. Look, Lord, I've done everything you ever told me to do, and I'm still in this particular place. Look, Jesus, I've honored you faithfully. I, I feel called to ministry. I'm doing the thing, and you don't seem to be anywhere. Your voice is so silent. I'm not sure you really exist anymore. A mentor of mine gave me this great book, and I texted her about it this week because it, the book came to mind, Philip Yancey's Disappointment with God. He's got a really uh, fascinating story. I'm also listening to his memoir on Audible, and it's amazing because it, it's fundamentalist, legalistic, all of this kind of in his background, and he's, he comes to a place in college where he goes... I don't know about this anymore because I've checked all the boxes, but there actually hasn't been relationship. So in this book, he seeks to answer the questions, is God unfair? Yeah, <laughs> but so is grace. Is God silent? You can feel like that sometimes. Is God 
hidden. But what is the invitation for us in that hiddenness? Or like they sat on Holy Saturday in their grief, what is Jesus inviting us into? It's not what more can we do, but how much more can we be with him to hear his voice that settles us? This is the message my my mentor wrote to me in the book. I didn't realize she'd written it to me until I pulled it out this week and I texted her and I said, Beth, you have no idea what you meant to me. And speaking the truth and sitting with me in this. She says, disappointment can sometimes define life on earth. I hope this book will speak to your own questions and be helpful as you minister to others with questions about God's goodness. He can handle your pain. Be honest and persevere. I wonder about those disciples on Saturday morning. What was it like to persevere in that moment? I have a feeling that it it, it felt pretty empty. Like maybe just some honest crying out and calling, what is this supposed to be, God? This is different than we had in mind. Perhaps it's the kind of brokenness that some of you have articulated only the Eucharist, only communion can solve for you. That you kind of open your mouth like a bird just needing a little bit of nourishment to get by. Here's a quote from this book that I think is helpful in this. Let's look at it on the screen. Is it there? No. Great. I'm going to read it. This is why you write it down. I had a strong sense that God doesn't care so much about being analyzed. Mainly, he wants to be loved. Nearly every page of his word wrestles with this message. And I returned home knowing I must somehow explore the relationship between a passionate God, hungry for the love of his people, and the people themselves. All feelings of disappointment with God trace back to the breakdown in that relationship. What do we do in disappointment? Can we hold on to the truth that Jesus can both be our king of glory and our Prince of Peace. He's the Lion and the Lamb is what Scripture says. He comes in glory and power and goodness and He can do the impossible and He's also a Lamb, meek and gentle and unable really to do anything. Jesus can be both of those things as our leader. We don't have that in our context. Our leaders are polarized. They're bullies or they're they're milk toast. We have folks that can't pull it together to lead with both meekness and grace and courage and power and strength. But that's who Jesus is, which is why Jesus calls us to put our hope in nothing but him. He holds the keys to all truth and love and power and grace and will meet us in every disappointment. Be honest and persevere. Is God safe? Not always. It doesn't feel that way. Is he worth it? Always. Because he proves himself to be trustworthy in the cross. He does the thing. Spoiler alert for next week. He raises from the dead. He does what he says he's going to do. He establishes his kingdom, but it doesn't look powerful and mighty on a big white horse. It looks like grace and generosity and the fruits of the spirit. Love, peace, goodness, patience, self-control, kindness, faithfulness. These are the things that give us life. Not our power, not our possessions, not our own will or sense of what we think to be right. Jesus is trustworthy. Will you put your faith in him? There's a song I've been meditating on this Lent, and I'll close with this, that has been a real gift to me and any sort of squabbling I have in my own mind about expectations, disappointed or otherwise. And it's a Rich Mullins song brought to life by Sarah Groves. 
There's a group of people that, that took his songs and re-recorded them in his old home in Bellsburg, Tennessee. It's called the Bellsburg Sessions. Sarah Groves is one of those people that collaborated on this project. And there's a song called Hold Me Jesus that I think is so helpful for those disciples on Saturday in their grief and for us in our, all our expectations in the triumphal entry. Well, sometimes my life just don't make sense at all. When the mountains look so big and my faith just seems so small. Hold me, Jesus, I'm shaking like a leaf. You've been my king of glory. Won't you be my prince of peace? And I wake up in the night and feel the dark. It's so hot inside my soul. I swear there must be blisters on my heart. Hold me, Jesus, I'm shaking like a leaf. You have been king of my glory. Would you be my prince of peace? So Jesus, this is what we ask, that you would help us to hold the tension of you being both our king of glory and our prince of peace. You have come to do the unimaginable and the incredible, but it so often looks different than our expectations. So be near to us in the moments when we need you most. Help us to be honest and persevere. Help us to put one foot in front of the other, calling out to you whenever we have need. Would your Holy Spirit comfort us and encourage us? And would we as a people comfort and encourage one another, being an example of your peace to each other? Prepare our hearts this week as we um, get ready to celebrate Easter next week, perhaps reading the book of John, perhaps having a conversation with a friend about our own spiritual uh, existence right now, whatever it looks like. Would you guide us, Lord, preparing us to celebrate that you've done it? You've made it possible for ha us to have life and life to the full. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.